It is a wonderful uh, morning after a wonderful evening that we've had together uh, here at large. A conference that I do believe will help us all build a bridge toward a conservative future in this country that will be inclusive of so many of you in this room. What you have to offer is very important. Again, I want to thank our host, uh, the Hayride, Christy and Scott, for uh, sponsoring and helping us do this, and our friends at uh, Freedom Works for throwing, showing their support. Now this morning, we are going to, of course, open with prayer, and then we're going to have several key personalities to begin this program with uh, Reverend Shannon Wright and um, then Dr. Tim Johnson and my good friend Star Parker will keynote this prayer breakfast. Later on we want to make certain that you hear well, my good friend Jeff, Jeff Landry, well, there he is. Jeff Landry is back there. And Jason Hurt, Ebert, will be there. For those of you north of the Mason Dixon line or north of Alexandria, uh, that, uh, that is not Hebert down here, that is Ebert. Okay, and so, of course, he may pronounce it Hebert, I don't know. <laughs> but just the same, we're going to have a wonderful time here today. And then we're going to cap the evening off uh, with uh, a message from a woman who I greatly admire, uh, my good friend, Deneen Borelli. So we have a fully packed day. And I believe, Pastor Wright, you're on to open with prayer. Is that right? And uh, we're going to now invite Pastor Wright up to open with prayer. Let us be prayerful. Because as we mentioned last night, there are difficult days ahead of us. And we do indeed need to prepare for the journey that we're on. Pastor Wright. something you just say. It's an exercise. So let's get the blood flowing. That's why we've got Mary Mary playing in the background. Because the whole point of this song is go get your blessing. And I was taught that to get your blessing, you have to be a blessing. So my prayer this morning is for God. I pray strength for every politically active that is an elected official, that's a candidate, that you get your blessing by being a blessing. That you have strength in God. That you use that strength to give you a spirit of boldness so that you can not just do the usual and the normal, but that you can earn your blessing. That you have the strength to tell the folks you work with to stand tall and be proud. I pray your strength to tell people as you go forward and represent, represent them in truth. Tell them to speak truth to power. I pray your ability to do that. So when folks ask you a question, I pray your strength to be able to tell them, no, we don't believe in same-sex marriage. I pray your strength to tell them, we believe in life from conception. I pray your strength to tell them that we believe, not as man says, but as the Bible says, from the beginning and the dawn of time. That is my prayer for all of you this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Thank you so much, Pastor. Now the program will proceed as it is written. Uh, one of the things that I almost detest in a, a MC or a moderator is a guy has to jump up and down all the time. And so, and so if you, you, I know everybody in here, I, I, I'm presuming that everybody here can read. You do have a program. So if you see your name on the program, you're next. <laughs> so, 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 so whoever's next, come on up and let's let the program move along uh, as it is printed. Well, I guess we heard from the Reverend this morning, didn't we? First of all, giving honor to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I want to thank you all for coming here today, and I want to thank Reverend C.L. O'Brien for an opportunity to speak before you all this morning. Uh, I have 15 minutes, and I don't want to necessarily take up all 15 minutes, but I do want to lay a few things in your heart as we prepare for this day. And I had the opportunity of going before my friend, Star Parker, as I'm sure that she's going to deliver another one of her outstanding conversations with us this morning. The two things that I think are very important, representing the Frederick Douglass Foundation, we have 24 chapters around the country, uh, and on behalf of our leadership team, that includes Dean Nelson and Troy Rowland, uh, we are very thankful for the many opportunities that we've been blessed with as it relates down to being part of this new movement that's taking place in the United States. Something that I think is critical to our success and something that's gonna be valuable to our uh, success in 2014 and 2016, as I'm sure many of you are looking forward to an opportunity to ensure that we maintain control of Congress, i.e. the House of Representatives, but also take over the Senate and prepare things so that we can reclaim our rightful place in the White House. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. Right. Here, here. But not only are those things important on the national level, but we need to be making sure that we do the same thing here at local levels, both at the state level as well as the county and city environments. Oftentimes you hear us talk about the grassroots campaign and grassroots efforts, but too often times we don't spend enough time talking about those things that are affecting us each and every day, i.e. the city and the county. So there are two things that we're doing at the Frederick Douglass Foundation that I think are very important. So let me tell you what those two things are. The first thing is that we're starting our own initiative called Success in Politics. And just to give you kind of an idea of what that looks like, the first thing is that in order for us to be successful, how many candidates do we have in this room right now? Potential candidates. Uh, as I stated last night, I'm the former vice chairman of the North Carolina Republican Party, so I know a little bit about how the system works. The first thing I want to challenge you all to do is that you have to decide that you want to be committed. Committed to the cause, committed to the efforts, and committed to our principles within our party because one of the challenges that we have today is that we have a lot of people that call themselves Republicans, but when it comes down to what they believe, they really don't back it up with their actions. Here, 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 here. Here, here, talk, man. We've got to decide as a community that we're no longer going to be satisfied with people who talk a good game but don't know how to walk a game. And that means that we've got to spend some effort doing some vetting ourselves. We've got to make sure that those individuals that have an R next to their name, who call themselves conservatives, are truly conservative. As you heard the Reverend Wright already say, that you are not pro-life. If you're not about traditional marriage, you already have a question for me. Because I need to understand where you're coming from. And if you can't be, st if you can't be steadfast on those two issues right off the bat, then we're going to have some concerns when it talks about education, uh, when we talk about incarceration, uh, when we talk about unemployment, and we talk about a whole host of other things, we're already going to have some problems because you're wobbling and you're wobbling and going back and forth. So that's the first one is that we've got to get people that are committed. The second one is that we've got to have people that know how to communicate. As you heard so well last night, I'm talking about runaway slaves, one of our biggest problems that the Reverend asked was, how many of us talk about the history of the Republican Party? How many of us know the history of the Republican Party? How many of these people know that the Republican Party was founded March 20th, 1854? If you don't know that, then you got to ask yourself why you don't know that. See, I find it interesting that we as Christians talk a good game, but when you say, have you read from Genesis to Revelation, most people can say John 3, 16, and that's about as far as they come. How can you really call yourself a Christian if you haven't even taken the time and you're over the age of 20 to read the Bible at least once? How can you call yourself a Republican? A Republican if you don't know what our party stands for. Our party has nine principles, nine simple principles. With the last one being that we believe the Republican Party is the best vehicle to make these things happen, and yet so many of you in this room don't know those principles. You see, you can't have a conversation with a liberal if you don't understand what we stand for. And that's how they beat us up all the time. 
We've also got to take time to have pride in those individuals that look like us, who believe like us, and who have been out here doing the work. Because too often times we want to talk about Alan West, or we want to talk about Tim Scott, but you know there's a whole lot of Star Parkers out there. Yeah. There's a whole lot of Tim Johnson, there's a whole lot of King Carl Smiths out there, but we don't take the time to talk about them. We want to pick four or five people, and all of a sudden they're the representative for all Republicans. Right. We've got to do a better job of communicating our message. And what I would say is that we have our calendar, the Frederick Douglass Foundation calendar, and it's a great opportunity to learn about the history that most of you don't know, because we should be bragging about the Emancipation Proclamation 150 year anniversary this year, because Abraham Lincoln signed that January 1st. And we should be bragging about the I Have a Dream speech that Dr. Martin Luther King made August 28th, because he was a Republican. And we should be bragging about Jackie Robinson in, the 40, in the number 42, that the movie just came out, because he also was a Republican. But see, many of you don't know that. And so if you don't know the history, then when it comes down to being in your toolbox, you don't have the tools necessary to have a conversation that you need to have to convince your friends that they need to be looked at the Republican Party. And then finally, we need to be consistent. Ladies and gentlemen, too often times we get excited about the six or seven days, six or seven days before an election process, and all of a sudden we want the black community, the Hispanic community, every other community to come to the table. You know, I like the United States did three did things 365 days a year. We actually took time to get to know our community. We took time to get involved in our community. We took time to deliver a message. We took time to make sure people know that as a Republican, I care about the community. As a Republican, I care about the things that are happening in our society. It would be a beautiful thing if we did that, but too often times we wait two or three months before an election cycle, and all of a sudden, it's time to talk to these communities. We've got to change that. We've got to look at 2014 and say that I'm committed to making a difference. I'm committed to having my voice heard. I'm committed to making sure that there's a, a change, a new voice. And the only way that's going to change is that we're serious about being consistent. But that's one side of the coin that I think we have an opportunity to do. The other side of the coin is something very simple, but I want to put this on all the hearts in this room. Back in the 1930s, 1940s, there was a man by the name of James G. Thomas, Thompson, and he came out with a double victory campaign. Some of you may have heard about it. If you know anything about history, you know about the black community. He wrote a letter saying that while we're talking about victory abroad with the Germans and the Japanese, we're not talking about the victory of black folks. And so the Frederick Douglass Foundation said that we're going to do something that we're going to reunite this. And the intent of the double victory campaign is we want victory for the Republican Party, but we also want victory for black conservatives. We want double victory. Because, see, if we continue to have the same thing go on in our society, that all we do is elect the same people, and we start having the same problem, we continue to have the same problems we have with blacks not getting elected. Star Parker ran. She didn't get elected. Bill is around there somewhere. He didn't get elected. We can go on and on and on. We have to make sure that we change the dynamic. We have never had a black woman represent the Republican Party in the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate ever in the history of this country. <coughs> And we've never had a black female serve as governor of any state at any time of any party in U.S. history. This is 2013. Isn't it time that we make some changes? Yeah, yeah. Isn't it time that we make some commitments? Isn't it time that we stop talking about what we're going to do for somebody and put some money behind it? Isn't it time that we stop talking about what we're going to do for somebody and make sure that we're volunteering for them? Isn't it time that we stop talking about what we're going to do and we make sure that we bend and we support those candidates that we say we supposedly love so much? It's time for us to get serious. So if we want to have victory for our party, and I'm a Republican through and through, but I also want to make sure the black conservative voice is heard. And I want to make sure that each one of you understand that if we're serious about this conference, the new majority, then that means we've got to do things different. We've got to be strong, we've got to persevere, and we've got to be committed. God bless and thank you. Thank you. It is wonderful to be here at large, a conference for the new majority. And thank you, Tim, for those kind words about my failed election. <laughs> and that now has become a major part of my bio when the left is talking about me, her failed run. But yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. One reason that we lost is um, because five months is just not enough time to undo 50 years of social engineering. and. Um, and that, that has been done in the black community. One of the biggest challenges we ran into is that the district, I didn't live there. Uh, the Republican Party at that point had responded to the 
the call of Michael Steele, then the chairman, to make sure that they ran somebody in every district. Uh, when they went to Hawaii, the 168 of those that make up the Republican Party, the, um, the leaders of the party, a couple of them from each state. When they went away to Hawaii that year, he came back, they came back with a command to put somebody in every district because what had happened, because of all the gerrymandering, is the Republican Party just weren't running anyone anymore. So when the California delegation came back, they looked at all the districts. They, of course, said, oh, girl, we had to go to these neighborhoods we've not been in in like 20, 30 years. Um, who shall we select? And so I was asked to return from Washington, D.C., and then go in a district I've never lived in because I, 20 years ago, escaped Los Angeles County, moved to Orange County, and I'm behind the orange curtain, and I like it there. I go into L.A. only so that I can do two things, visit with my grandkids, my seven-year-old grandson, I'm teaching him how to fish, and my one-year-old granddaughter, I'm teaching her how to shop. So I have to go up to L.A. to do that. So I went in that district, and what was interesting about it is prior to gerrymandering, it was a Republican district, uh, but when they drew a Berlin Wall right down the city of, of Long Beach and separated out the Republicans from the liberals and drew about five streets in Compton into the newly formed district, the Republican Party picked up its ball and back went home. It was a Republican district. They hadn't run anyone in that district in 20 years. So we had our work cut out for them. So I do agree with you, Tim, that there's work to be done and we need to take seriously the opportunities in front of us. I want to thank you for giving me opportunity to come here and speak to you today. And at this conference, I understand that we're to talk about um, at large, you know, and what that means. He said it's not in confinement or captivity, at liberty. And what has happened to the African American community is we haven't been at liberty in a long time. We have been convinced to move from slavery to Jim Crow to Jim Crow to the welfare state. And that is a challenge for us today. And so I want to talk a little bit about those challenges. Uh, because changing the black quest for social justice to a quest for economic empowerment is going to be uh, hard work. And I'm just glad to see so many that are committed to doing some of that work. A lot of people know me because they see me on Fox. And I know that Deneen's in the room. And when you go out traveling, they, they tell you, oh, you look so much prettier in person because they just want to come to your meeting just to see you in person. I think, thank you. And others um, read my column. I'm a syndicated columnist with Scripps News Service and have been for about 10 years now. We have about 400 papers in the country. Uh, some of my papers, like the Korean Times, runs me every single week. And what's fascinating about that particular paper is that the whole paper is in Korean except the editorial page, and there I am. You know, so you run into uh, different fans that are looking at um, uh, you from a different angle. Uh, so a lot of people think they know me, but what they might not know about me, I'll tell a little bit about today just so that um, you'll get a perspective on who I am and why I'm aggressively in the battle that we are. And so appreciating what uh, CL and his team are doing uh, with this great conference. You know, I've been in public life now for 25 years, and a lot of people know my story, know that as a young woman I was on welfare. You know, I, I tell people I got caught up in the lie of the left. I believe that the poor were poor because the wealthy were wealthy. I believe that my problems were somebody else's fault, and I believe that America was so inherently racist that I didn't have to mainstream. And I ended up spiraling into a little dark hole uh, where after a Christian conversion, I was able to just change my life. I completed college and I went and started a business. For people that want more details, I've said my details over and over again. I don't have time this morning, they've only given me 30 minutes, but I did bring a few copies of my book, Uncle Sam's Plantation, where I talk about my personal story. It's not my autobiography, but even that is not all the way complete because of statutes of limitations I wasn't sure about. I didn't put all the details there. You know, Deneen and I were just familiarizing ourselves a little bit about where we're from, and even though we run at each other all the time in the green room at Fox, we found out that we actually grew up near each other uh, in, in, in New Jersey. At least I went to high school there. There. And so her husband then chimed in and said, aren't you so glad that that was before the internet and DNA? And I'm like, yeah. So I left uh, uh, right after I went to California but uh, and, and, and was in Los Angeles. And after the 92 Los Angeles riots, I began to work in public policy. I worked on welfare reform from 94 to 96, and then I founded my current organization, CURE. And we're the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. We are a policy think tank. We promote market-based solutions to fight poverty. Uh, we've been headquartered in Washington, D.C. now for seven years, and I hope that if you're in the Capitol, that you'll come by and visit us, stop by and visit us. In fact, my pro-life friends are not only stopping by and visiting us, now they're bringing their suitcases 
pieces with them. And I'm noticing that our library is getting more and more, more materials in it, which I welcome you to do as well. We have a wonderful location at 13th and F uh, in Northwest, right there, two blocks from the White House, and we're in the historical Sun Building um, across the street from the National Press Club. I started the work of CURE because I knew firsthand about the political promises of entitlement that, and how they had caused generations to be pathologically dependent on centralized planning and government programs. And I concluded, like many Americans, especially some of the Americans that are hosting this particular meeting, that are now fast friends of, of Freedom Works and are starting to push these ideas into communities that we haven't visited in a long time, ideas of, of, of traditional values and limited government and free markets and strong national allegiance and defense. And for the first time uh, in my adult life, uh, we're beginning to see the American flag like never before, not only in Washington DC, but all across this country where people are able to point out fellow patriots, and I think that that is a healthy thing. Traditional values has to be a focus because choice loses its meaning if it doesn't matter what we choose. Limited government, because the role of government is to protect private property and personal pursuits, not to plunder them, not to exploit them. And of course, free markets, because profit is good. Profit is moral. Profit yes. gives us the engine, the capital, to invest in the future advances so that we can create jobs. And it's fascinating to me how we disconnect ourselves on how we get the very jobs that we keep saying we want. And then, of course, a strong national allegiance and defense. And my life story embodies American exceptionalism. So I take exception to people who say that we're not exceptional. Because what my life story proves is that anyone from any background or ethnicity, anyone that even needs just another start in life, can get that fresh start. They can be born again, they can set some new goals, and they can realize their dreams. So I was very grateful when the Tea Party showed up in 2009 in Washington uh, because I, they came to talk about American socialism and I had talked about American socialism in my second book, the book I only have a few copies of out for anyone that doesn't have it already. Uh, I have an um, opportunity for you to get it for $20. Uh, I also have our newsletter, but that's for free. And you can um, have a copy of that if you want to, but don't be surprised if I then ask you for a donation to my organization because I'm an entrepreneur. But I talked about American socialism in that book that I re-released last year, but wrote 10 years ago. You know, and up, in, up until the Tea Party showed up, I had grown to agree with one of my colleagues who when I moved there full time about seven years ago, I'm kind of bi-coastal, but people say that must be really difficult. I'm like, if you've ever been on a 405 freeway in LA, no, this is easy, you know, to go across the country and do your work and then go back home. But when you, it's kind of like when you go on vacation and you go, you're, you're going somewhere on a regular basis and you just really love the place and then finally you move in and you start seeing things that you didn't see before, like you never noticed the roaches. Well, Washington, D.C. is a lot like that, and so I saw a very interesting uh, opportunity. It was two political enemies. They were having dinner together, enjoying bread and wine and, and laughter. And you know, I, I looked at this and asked my colleague about it. He said, you know, there's an old saying in Washington that politics is like professional wrestling. The conflict's for the crowd, because at the end of the day, they're in business, and they're in the same business. And, they, they, and what happens in business, and in particular business in Washington, D.C., is what happens in most businesses when people work together. Their children grow up together. They have a lot of opportunities to spend quality private time together, and it's one of the reasons that Washington has been so out of, out of control. And another reason that I so appreciate this opportunity to be part of opening a new chapter uh, in dialogue within the black community. And so I do thank you, CL, for inviting me. Because one question that has been long overdue to ask after 50 years of government intervention into the affairs of black people is where are blacks today with regards to the social justice that they have been taught to quest through politics? Social justice defined, the act of redistribution of wealth, the great equalizer the level playing field between the haves and the have-nots, those that were uh, able to enjoy the movie as I did last night uh, for the first time. I'm just not a movie watcher. It was nothing offensive about that. I just never have sat down uh, to watch movies. Two hours, me, sit, someone else's creativity, not be able to say anything. No, my friends know not to take me to movie theaters. They've tried a few times, but they just won't ever go back again as we're escorted out because I'm just not going to let somebody sit there and indoctrinate me without having something to say back. But I did enjoy that movie. It was a little tough to sit there, and me and Seal's wife did talk to quite a bit of it. But, um, but you know, we saw 
that, that, that messaging of those that are part of the Socialist Party, and that's those that are defined in social justice, this great equalizer, the rich and the poor, the discussions there, the privileged uh, versus the underclass. And some now are going as far to say out loud as the president of Zimbabwe that we're going to take from the sons of the enslavers and give it to the sons of the enslaved. So for after 50 years, blacks have been taught to put, their, to put liberal policies and politicians above all other concerns, above their faith, above their family, above their freedom, in exchange for social justice. Black culture now is all about social justice. And you know, it's interesting, I'm, I'm reading this new book on uh, organizational development, which you know, I, I, I've grown my group, but I bought the book because of, you know, team, building out a team, you know, you know but then you got to storm it, then you got to normalize things and hope that you can get some production out of these folks. So I wanted to get a little bit of insight, but what's fascinating about this particular book is the first chapter is on culture. And as I'm reading this book, thinking I'm getting uh, new information about how to build out a organizational culture within my business, I'm seeing black culture and black America, and actually uh, it's full of different strategies that I hope that we'll adopt as we look forward to moving into these harder hit communities. Because when you start changing culture and it becomes disembedded, it will, uh, it will help us understand a lot of the venom that comes at anyone that decides to uh, dispute their worldview. And it is definitely embedded in our culture. And so uh, I just wanted to say that as a side for somebody that wants to get a deeper understanding in what has broken down, why are they so vicious toward anyone that would dare to escape, and uh, how do we then change it? That if you just copy that first chapter, you might get some new insight. But liberals, they always pretend that they're against war, but in their quest for power, they started three wars against the American culture, and they convinced blacks to look the other way in the black quest for social justice. The civil rights generation of the 50s wanted revival. Dr. King was a preacher. You wouldn't even know that if you went to his memorial. I don't know if you noticed that when you went to his memorial. There is not one symbol that he was a preacher. They don't have reverend, they don't have pastor, and there's not one scripture. You would think that he was a social justice activist and a community organizer. And in fact, is barely anything there that talks about the civil rights movement. Much of the discussion is about Vietnam and demilitarization and unions aside. But the civil rights movement, he was a pastor. This was a moral movement. And it was a, a movement for repentance and revival. But the black power generation of the 70s wanted revenge. And even though mountains of data point to the connection between religion and traditional marriage to civil order, protection of private property and economic prosperity, blacks got caught up in the political promises of social justice and became the casualties of three liberal cultural wars. The first liberal cultural war, and I was hearing last night that we want to start looking for an exchange in terminology about whether we're discussing liberal or conservative. They're both political terms, and so we've grown accustomed to it. But I heard last night that perhaps progressive would be one word that we would use more often to expose their lies. Well, I'll use progressive progressives about these wars. The first war that they started in the 60s was the war on religion, which weakened our public institutions and opened a door to a culture of corruption. When you look at your legislators, your lawmakers at 13% approval rating, I mean, this is not healthy. Uh, you can tell that we have diminished ourselves by taking away moral order. We've scrubbed our schools of all reference to God. In 1962, the Supreme Court struck down state-sponsored school prayer. In 1963, the courts ruled you cannot read the Bible or recite the Lord's Prayer in public schools. By 1980, the courts ruled to remove the Ten Commandments from the public schools. The second war that the liberal progressives declared was a war on marriage, which weakened women and opened the door for a culture of meaninglessness. Homosexuality now is dividing us and bringing hostility into the public square. What is the result for blacks? AIDS is in the top two killers of black women today between 25 and 34. The answer to that question is all sexual behavior is adult behavior. Keep it private. And I'm getting ready to expose some things that are on the New York City's website about sexual matters that are unbelievable. In fact, they are so repulsive that it reminds me of the scripture that says, we are not even to speak of these things in public. And yet it's the city, with city money in partnership with organizations like Planned Parenthood, that are so repulsive that we must address. 
uh, because they are exploiting then the new uh, look, if you will, which is called ethnically ambiguous. Um, you know, it's a term out of Hollywood. My daughter's an actress, and when you get categorized in there, you get a lot of work because people can't really tell what you are, but they know that you're not blonde and blue, and they are not blonde and blue in this campaign of the city of New York. Abortion has deeply hurt us, and we'll hear a lot more about that later uh, because my fast friend uh, Ryan Bomberger is in the room and he will be bringing that presentation. And I see him quite often visiting now at our office in Washington, D.C., and I appreciate that. <laughs> we got coffee there, too. I think Alvita's there right now. Your conference room is being reserved for who? Alvita and her team. Okay. 55 million dead in 40 years should give us all a great pause. 55 million. Now, the left wants to say well, we're just serving up the marketplace, that we're just trying to fill a, 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 a supply for a demand of abortion. I am not convinced that over a million women a year would be killing their offspring if abortion uh, weren't legal. The result for blacks, gosnells preying on the most poor and the most vulnerable. I mean, they have to read about 14-year-olds who they had, who had a 14-year-old girl who was in the clinic who had an eight-month abortion. And as his defense said in the courts in Philadelphia before he was handed down his sentence, what did you think we were doing in the clinics? And we're talking about abortion. What do you think it is? And especially if it's late term. How do you get a child out of a womb and throw it out as trash if you're not dismembering and cutting up. In fact, remember, Gosnell was a part of the, the Mother's Day Massacre where they were trying a new late-term experiment where they would put razor blades together and put gel to hold them in place while after they inserted it into the woman, the gel would melt down and then uh, the results would be discarded as trash. In 1960, 75% of American adults were married compared to around 50% today. In 1960, 45% of young adults between 18 and 24 were married compared to just 9% today. In 1980, when Ronald Reagan was president, 18% of births were outside of marriage compared to 43% today. 1.7 million out of wedlock births in 2011 alone. Blacks moved from 22% in the 60s of out of wedlock births to 72% today. Whites moved from 3% in the 60s to just under 3% today. Hispanics, while there's no data in the 60s because they weren't a special interest group uh, being exploited for political reasons, uh, they didn't separate them out as a, a particular group. Uh, but today we have data and uh, Hispanic out of wedlock birth rates are at 53%. The third war that these progressives declared was a war on poverty. And what was interesting about their wars is they were all during the same time that blacks were saying, remove governmental barriers so we can live free. At the same time that a, a group of spiritual men took charge of our, of our community to say that we are going to fight for the right to live like Americans and, and have this country move themselves back to their founding documents. It was a moral cry and we have moved away from that and we ended up with these three wars going on at the very same time, coupling rules uh, of, of engagement, as you heard last night, the means test of a welfare policy, don't work, don't save, don't get married, in an environment of sexual meaninglessness to where we tell women you own yourself and there are no absolute guidelines to your sexuality and more. In fact, there are no longer natural consequences. We now have safety nets. Well, this opened the door to a culture of entitlement. It weakened family. The Great Society has had great cost. In just 50 years, blacks went from 70% of children being raised in married, by married parents to 70% being raised by single parents today. In just 50 years, blacks went from a civil rights movement to remove governmental barriers over education to current black male dropout rates in most neighborhoods uh, at 70% today. In just 50 years, blacks went from landowners and entrepreneurs to today, less than 5% of blacks even own their own business, with the majority of those businesses as mom and pops with incomes around $100,000 a year or less. The legacy of our 50-year quest for social justice is our blighted inner cities, our dysfunctional government-run schools, and our broken black families. How can we build a community of free and prosperous people if we are a community of irresponsible people? If our goal as blacks is to gain economic empowerment, then we must begin immediately to reverse the laws and the programs of big government progressives that created an environment of moral relativism, sexual recklessness, and economic envy. 
So today our first order of business must be to get the message of freedom and personal responsibility into the communities hit hardest by these three cultural wars. And so as we were hearing last night about this new program to go into colleges, I've been in a lot of colleges across this country and it's a very hostile environment. In fact, I've been in 190 colleges in every state in the union. But when I went into the, my final state a couple of months ago, North Dakota, I said, now what will I do? I sat on first class on airplane, I was like, wow, I just left my 50th state union, now what will I do? And the guy next to me, chimed in and said, well, you can go to the, um, to the libraries. And I didn't know we were on our way to um, uh, a city that houses Truman's library. And I said, well, I don't go to uh, Democrat libraries. And he said, um, well, Truman's library is in Independence, Missouri. And, if, and, um, and actually, if he were alive today, he'd be a Republican. So I said, well, maybe I will go visit there. Then I start telling about all the libraries across the country, that, you know, how George Bush's uh, it's pretty interesting. He has a bird on the wall, but he's a collector of any and everything to do with the Wild West. So if you want to see any of the gold in their posters and their guns, they're down here, they're in his library in College Station. But the most fascinating is, is, uh, is Gerald Ford's, believe it or not. I mean, he was uh, pretty much a boring president, but if you go into his library, you're walking through these stale, stark halls. But the minute you walk into the first room, all of a sudden a disco ball starts turning and the age of Aquarius starts playing. And you're like, what in the world is going on? And then you hear, King in one corner, and you hear Kennedy in another, and you hear all of this activity at the same time, and then you just hear a shot, and everything goes quiet. And so I suppose their message is he's the great stabilizer. But he's telling me I should go to libraries, and the other guy says, well, why don't you just visit the state capitals? And I thought, well, now that must be, that would be pretty interesting uh, uh, to do. So I've been on those college uh, campuses, but I think that the strategy that um, that CL is working out with his team at, uh, at through outreach at, at, at um, the, the Freedom Works and with Deneen is to go in there and have discussion, not debate, discussion about what has happened to blacks. Uh, because blacks must first begin to understand that the first step to economic empowerment is to recognize the humanity of every individual and their ability to live free. You know, the, the, the steps out of poverty are not rocket science but people need to be free to take them. And it's insulting that liberals pretend they care about the poor, yet they stand in the way of school choice vouchers and of personal responsibility, both measures to put one on the path to economic prosperity and independence. The poor more than anyone need help getting their children out of broken schools and from under broken health care policy, broken housing policy, broken retirement policy, and broken welfare policy. The poor more than anyone need to understand the nature of money, the principles of capitalism, and com compound interest. They have been locked in these government cesspools we call schools for 50 years, and they've been learning multiculturalism and diversity, and yet our country was founded on principles of the pluribus unum, many becoming one. That was what was interesting even in Truman's library, because I did go. And, uh, and he has the original rug that shows e pluribus unum because they, they were dealing with, during that time, similar challenges that we're dealing with during our time to t bring in people of different ethnicities and cultures and how do you build, pull them together? They had a lot of Irish and Italians and others coming into the country at the same time and they needed to build out an Americanism, American culture, and American exceptional culture. This is why CURE works with the media and policy, uh, with our network of, of conservative urban churches around this country, so that we can we can work on these ideas uh, to get school choice, to get understanding. And I look forward to working with this new project of Freedom Works to get messengers and leaders into discussions with fellow blacks. And I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. you. Star Parker.